Hey friends, my guest today is my mom. She is a world traveler, creative entrepreneur, home decor enthusiast, and grandmother. In this episode, she tells the story of being pushed from her strict Jehovah's Witness household to moving on and creating her own family. She is a kind, caring, generous, creative, and thoughtful person, and I love her very much. I hope you enjoy her story. Here she is, Sherilyn Maxwell. I agree. And that's, I, I know that doesn't define you, but it's a crazy mm-hmm. story. And I don't think people understand how weird certain religions are and what believing in something can force you to do to the people in your life. Mm-hmm. So that's why I wanted to start with that one. So okay. we, can, we can get right into it. Uh, so you, why don't you talk about uh, where you grew up? Well, first of all, I wanted to say, I know you're the person that's directing this, but first of all, I wanted to say how um, extremely proud I am of you. Thank you. That you're doing this. I'm like blown away at, because I've always kind of thought you were a little bit bashful, but I feel like this, what you're doing now, is kind of showing what I've thought you've always had inside of you that brings out more conversation and just, I wanted to say that at the beginning, how proud I am. Cool. Thank you. Um. So your question to me was starting out about religion. Well, just go go from the start, where you grew up in Southern California. Okay. Well, um, Southern California girl, um, love the sun, love the warmth, and it's because I was born in um, Garden Grove. Actually, I was born in Westminster, but was raised in Garden Grove, which is about... 10 minutes from Disneyland. Mm -hmm. So um, that kind of lifestyle down there of lots of people, um, the school I went to, lots of kids, uh, just always, always loved people. So that was like my element. You you know, Eric and I would hop on our bikes and ride up the street and there was always kids out to play with and um, warm weather, you know, never, never what you're used to of having winters that are cold. So we were just always, seems like we were always playing outside. Mm -hmm. Um, great childhood as far as just simply living by the beach and having, you know, fun days at the park. Balboa Park was a big place we would always go. I have really fond memories of going there and with groups of kids and playing hide and seek. Like that was in the day where you could let your kids when they were six, seven, they would go play hide and seek in a park, like a huge park and hide for, you know, I didn't see my mom for 45 minutes. And Eric was even a little than me and we were doing it. So Mm -hmm. I had these memories of like just this really, this freedom when we were playing in the parks and that kind of thing and riding our bikes. Um, It felt like a safe environment. It was. I mean, in those days, that was in the 70s, right? Mm -hmm. So I actually was in the late 60s, early 70s. So did you go to Disneyland when it was? Every year. Every year? Because it was built in like 55, I think. Yeah. So it was yeah. still pretty new. I have memories of going to Disneyland at least once a year. We might have gone twice a year just because it was so close and mm-hmm. it wasn't expensive, you know. Yeah. And, of course, it didn't have all the same fun stuff that it has now. It wasn't as quite as elaborate. But it was the the main street, the main walkway, you know, when you walk in and it's just kind of got all those um, uh, uh, vendors. And I remember the... Um, the lollipops that they had for sale. That's my childhood memory of walking by. And every year we got to pick out one of those lollipops that would last like six months after you got yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, Disneyland was simpler and and very, I don't know, it wasn't as packed. You weren't like, you didn't walk in there and there wasn't people, you know, smushed up against you. So it was definitely kind of like just, I don't know, wasn't like how we think of going to Disneyland where you prepare a year to go to it. and yeah. Well, the rides are probably weaker too, right? Oh, they were little. They had the Dumbo ride and, yeah. you know, the Ferris wheel and, or not the Ferris wheel, but the, um, they had, they had the, um, what's the, the tube that takes you through all of them, the whole, through the whole thing. The monorail? The monorail. They yeah. had, that's an old one. And then the, the one in the mountain. Um, Thunder Mountain? Thun- no, not Thunder Mountain. It's Matterhorn. Either. Matterhorn. They had that one in 69, 70. Yeah, I remember. That and I, cool. That was this, probably the scariest one. Yeah. Right? Because it's kind of scary now. <laughs> That's the one. Do you remember when we went, when I was probably, I was young, I was probably six, seven, eight or whatever, and we saw Aerosmith? 
Yeah. Do you remember that? Waiting in line at the Matterhorn. At, at the Matterhorn, or at wasn't the Matterhorn. it? Yeah. I'm sorry, the Matterhorn. And I didn't know who they were. Oh, yeah. And your dad, your dad just freezes and lets them kind of cut through. And he's like, after they left, he goes, man, I should have said, can I shake your hand? <laughs> So yeah, though that was in the eighties, but yeah, in the sixties and seventies, it was it was a cool place, but it's not. It di- I mean, it didn't have quite the prestige I feel like that it has now. Yeah. Now it's just like this family vacation spot that everybody saves, you know, to go to. It wasn't like that back when we were there. Yeah. But my favorite part of living down in California was the beach. Mm-hmm. And you guys would go there all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Lots. And so your dad was he. Was he a landscaper at that point? Yes. So he had, um, I don't know when he switched to that, but he had a landscaping business and he did a lot of um, what I, my memory as a child was he did commercial accounts. So he had, you know, Pepsi or Coca-Cola. He did those corporate areas and he landscaped and, and took care of that stuff. And he made a great living, mm-hmm. you know. I mean, we I don't ever remember doing without. Like, we always had enough. And if you th- I think back, they had us when they were in their early 20s. So he was under 30 years old, and they had already bought their house. And, you know, California's not a cheap place to live. Yeah, so. and that was a good, good time to be putting your family in that community because it was a different place back then. Yeah, the the house, the first house that I remember that I have memories of is the house that they bought brand new. And I was probably six and Eric was four. And we moved into that and um, directly across the street in, so it's Orange County, Garden Grove, Orange County, Cypress, that area. Um, wasn't all houses across the street from where they built our new complex, or I mean our new subdivision, was strawberry fields that went on and on and on. Mm -hmm. And within, I don't know, 10 years after we had left California in 74, that was all filled in. There's no fields of orange groves or strawberry patches anymore. No, it's all condos and million-dollar houses. Yeah, well, and funny enough that you said that because that area we lived in in Cyprus was actually a very nice subdivision in the 70s. Going back when you guys were, I don't know, probably 10, 8, 10, 12, we went back and went back by my old house. It doesn't look like a nice subdivision anymore. Really? Mm-mm. Have you ever looked it up on Zillow to see how much it's worth? Mm-hmm. What's it worth? So my mom told me this, that just recently she told me that they paid – I want to say it was in the forty, fifty thousand dollar range. It might even have been less. Um, and I zillowed in, and it's like eight hundred thousand dollar house. Oh, like that's all. Seventeen hundred square feet. But that's what I'm saying. The neighborhood isn't the same look. Yeah, isn't the same feel that it was when I was growing up and riding bikes on the street. And I mean, same thing. Probably you'll say about where you grew up mm-hmm. in twenty five years. It might be completely different. Well, yeah. Every time I drive by it. It does look different. I went up there sometime in the last month, and there's there's different things all over the neighborhood. Mm-hmm. There's some houses that I don't even recognize. Mm-hmm. I know. Yeah. Stuff starts to overgrow, and <clears throat> you just, yeah, it changes. The colors of the houses change, and you're like, whose house is that? I don't remember that house. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, so that part of it, I mean, those are the, those are the good parts of living in Southern California for sure. And so you said you left in 74, so you would have been 10 or 11? I was 10. You were 10. And so what happened? Why did why did he and your mom decide to, to move you guys? Yeah. So Nikki was born in January of 1974. And I was 10. Eric was 8. And Nikki was kind of like the little grand surprise that showed up into our family. And um, I'll never forget that day. She was just like this a live baby doll that somebody handed me. And I mean, you're a 10 year old. I was absolutely baby crazy beyond belief. Mm-hmm. And it was like the best gift I could ever get in my life was somebody to hand me this brand new baby that said it was my sister. So that was a really happy time. Um, but something was going on with my f- parents as far as them f- either feeling like California was growing too quickly. They didn't want to raise their family in the city. Um, 
but through the years of getting older and learning more about um, kind of some of the background of the religious beliefs, I, I had always wondered if it had something to do with their thought process as far as what they believed Armageddon. They had always kind of, there was a thought process back in the day that the witnesses believed that the time frame of the end of the world was around 1975. Mm -hmm. And part of me, as I got older and understood more a little, a little more about that religious belief, um, I think they wanted to get us out of that hub into a place where it was just the life was a simpler, quieter life where you could maybe live off the land or something. Okay. And so they moved us up from where I was telling you about a place where I had lots of friends and school with lots of kids. And um, they moved us to Lakeview, Oregon. And you know all about Lakeview. Mm -hmm. And you, it's just, the, it was the most massive culture shock. And as a 10-year-old, I mean, I'm sure it could have been worse if I was... 15, it might have been worse. But at 10, it was still pretty detrimental. I remember just being just thrown back. And going to school, was it was a totally different feel, small and not as many kids. And then um, they moved us into a property that was 20 acres, kind of like a farm setting. Mm -hmm. We were city people. <laughs> I, I mean, I still consider myself a city person. Yeah, and I lived in Lakeview for ten years. I'm not. I'm not a. I'm not a country girl, and so we moved on to this acreage with a house. And then the people we moved up to Lakeview with, they were also from Southern California, and I think they had the similar plan of getting their family out of the city. Okay, I didn't know that part. Yeah. it was a. Uh, it was another another family within another, the church. Yes, another witness family. And so it's interesting because they were from San Diego, or maybe they moved back to San Diego. But anyway, they moved up, and their kids were a little bit younger than Eric and I. And uh, they took the house, you know, the house that was on the property. Then my mom and dad put on the uh, double-wide mobile home. That was the house we lived in. But the other family lived in that house that came with the property. I guess I've never seen that house. I always just thought it was the double-wide. No, it was, that house was literally... I don't know, 500 feet, 500 yards away. Really? You don't remember it? You were little. I don't remember anybody talking about that was part of their property too. Oh, so yeah. they own that house? Oh, yeah. And then the property went another 20 acres. There was a pond. You don't remember going out that way? I, I understood that they had a huge backyard. I didn't realize they had 20 acres oh, yeah. when I was a kid. Yeah. You, you, you were too little. I think you were too little to know that, but there was like alfalfa and there was a pond back there and a stream and there was a barn. Did they ever take you to the barn? I kind of remember the barn. So that was the part I was going to tell you. So we buy this, this property and along with the property came all these animals. So like we were instantly farmers and we really didn't know how to be farmers. So we had, Two Shetland ponies, uh -huh. chickens, peacocks, guinea hens. Um, I mean, everything that kind of goes on a farm came with that thing. Who sells 20 acres with two houses and ponies and stuff? That was just part of the deal? Yeah. And uh, the weirdest part was it also came in the barn was a spider monkey. In Lakeview, Oregon, a spider monkey was living in that barn. That's exotic, isn't it? It's not native. It's weird. Yeah, it was weird. So, yeah, so that was, you know, that oh. you, the whole thing, I'm just building all that in there because it was, it was culture shock. Yeah. Like beyond belief. And I've never in my entire life been a person that would ever consider myself has of ever being depressed mm -hmm. like honestly except I remember a feeling that I had never had in my life before but when I was about 10 to 12 years old I felt whatever depression might be I think that's what it was yeah. because it was such a big change of life so you're just hanging out in southern California and you, you got a new baby sister and then out out of the blue they're like hey we're, we're moving. gonna sell the house and move to Lakeview yeah. And so did you even understand what that meant, really? Um, no, because when you're 10, you just go with the flow, right? Yeah. I mean, you got to do what, what your parents decide. 
But you know, now that we're it, something else just sparked in my head, Eric or Cody. <laughs> sorry, we were talking about young days, and I was you called you Eric. Um, I do remember one of the main reasons now, and I do rem- remember my dad taking a trip up there prior to them saying they're moving us to Lakeview. And it had something to do also, again, with the religion because um, my dad was what they call an elder in the um, witness congregation. And I think he wanted to be used in a way where he felt like he was offering more to that religion. And so he was going to a place where he thought they needed help in that way. They needed, the congregation needed more elders or help with that situation. And that particular congregation in Lakeview was small. And I don't know the particulars of, you know, how many elders had or all that, but that was one of the, also the major deciding forces, as I recall, that he was moving his family they, they somehow reached out? Because that's such a tiny community. I think he went on the drive with this other man that we moved up with, and they both decided they wanted something in Oregon, and they wanted something small, and they wanted to be of help to the congregation. And when they hit the California border into Oregon, and they saw the lake, Lake um, Goose, Goose Lake, lake and they drove up, and I, I mean, I, I just, I don't know the exact particulars, but we ended up 14 miles in Oregon, in Lakeview, Oregon. That's such a weird place to end up. I know. After spending so much time there, I don't know why anybody would want to live there. I mean, I guess that's cool. You get 20 acres and some ponies and all that kind of stuff, but to go from Southern California like that. Yeah. No beach. Seems, oh, we had so four crazy. feet of snow in the winter. I'm like, I didn't even know snow. <laughs> So, yeah, that was a pretty big, pretty big change for all of us. So I want to go back because we didn't really state at the start. So we're talking about the religion of Jehovah's Witnesses. Correct. And so, so he, he was the primary force in getting into that path, right? He was the one that kind of sought it out or it sought him. No. So the way I've been told, the story that I've been told was my mom, when she was in high school, maybe her last year of high school, her mother, Alice, my grandma Alice, she was studying with the witnesses. And my mom started to kind of become interested. And so she started studying as well. Um, And at the time, I think my mom and dad were dating. I mean, they were dating in high school. And my dad was not the one that was at first, you know, grabbed by it. It was my mom. And then I think through time, he realized, you know, she was the person for him. I think he started to investigate it as well because he loved her. Yeah, and you can't have one in that religion. No, not not generally. It doesn't work very well. Yeah. I mean, my grandma Alice did. My my grandpa Ford never became a witness. My grandma Mm -hmm. was married to him for. 40 some years and they, he never converted, but, but my dad did and they both ended up, um, they got married and then they were, I believe, baptized into the religion before I was born. So I was born into the religion. Mm -hmm. There was no, like, I knew nothing different. Yeah. And so what, what was that like? How, how often did you guys have to go? to service? Did you have to do the whole door-to-door thing? Yeah. All of it? Yeah. So, you know, I mean, that's just part of the belief system. It, the way they they believe is that um, they've studied the scripture and they believe they're, it's their duty to go out and, you know, preach to everyone the yeah. word of God. And so I think, you know, it's, a, it's, their, it's their calling, really. It's what they do. So if you believe it with all your heart, then you're kind of convicted to do it. Yeah. I think the issue for me at a really young age, I mean, now that I look back, I think I knew at a very young age that I wasn't convicted. And I didn't know why. Because I was only 
that was all that I had. That was all I was given. I mean, I really don't know why I wasn't convicted. And so I started to kind of um, know I was different. And that's kind of a weird thing, too, to, like, be put into a situation where everyone is just singing and praising and reading and believing. And something inside of me was saying, gosh, I just don't know if I believe this. And so that's why it was a struggle for me, not necessarily at 10. I mean, I was kind of going with the flow. But once we moved to Lakeview, what has happened in me was um, I wasn't offered the same amount of uh, socialization that I crave and need in life. Yeah. And so that's when things really started to shift gears for me because the way – that you go through life in that religion is they really want to, they don't want you to be out learning things from other people, other ways. They don't want you to be learning about how, you know, to carve a pumpkin. Mm -hmm. They don't want you to learn about holidays in general because holidays are pagan and they don't want you to be a part of that. So as I started to have friends that weren't witnesses, which is what I did when I got to Lakeview because there weren't that many witness kids. Yeah. It was a little bitty town. Yeah. Um, it just started to spark things in me that made me think and question and and doubt. And they don't want you questioning anything. They just want no. you to, to blindly follow. Yeah. Yeah, it starts to go off the rails if you are questioning yeah. what's going on. Yeah. So it was so important to to your parents, they were so convicted in that religion that they left paradise and moved to central or low, uh, southern Oregon. Uh, they got you guys 20 acres. They start uh, getting themselves involved with that. Very, very involved in the church, mm -hmm. yeah. And so then you're in... Fifth grade. Fifth grade. And so you start going to school and meeting new people and discovering that there's other things going on, and then you you realize it's kind of not for you, right? Yeah, I would say, I mean, I've talked about this with Eric and Nikki a little bit. I, Nikki was only five when I was 15. So that's when it really started to switch for me was that I, I didn't want to go door to door. I didn't want to go to the meetings that were three times a week. I, there were all these things that I just knew it was like, it was a fake. It was, I was faking it. Yeah. Um, but when you're 15, you're still under your house rules. I mean, you remember being yeah. 15. You remember the conflicts we had. I'm like, Cody, because I'm your mom, you can't. And I knew that at 15. But to me, this was like bigger than just them telling me, no, you can't date. Or no, you can't go to the football games because there's a meeting tonight. It was bigger. It was about um, they wanted me to tell other people that I believed a certain way and they wanted me to help these people learn the way I was supposed to believe and I didn't believe it. Yeah. So that was what really happened to me when I was 15. It wasn't because I wanted to go to parties and because I wanted to, I mean, that was a bit of it, yeah. but the real part of it was that I was expected to teach others and tell others about this fantastic life of being a Jehovah's Witness and I didn't believe it. Mm -hmm. So that's when things really started to shift with me. Plus also at 15, you also start to think for yourself a little. You want to start learning things on your own. You don't want to be told what, every, what you're supposed to think. Um, you remember, 15, <laughs> oh, yeah. 16, 17. Mm -hmm. And by the time I was 17, it was difficult. It was a difficult life at home. Um, I found myself um, morally starting to change. Like I was learning to lie in order to um, do some of the things I wanted to do. Hang out with boys. And just, just live a normal life, Cody. It wasn't even necessarily that. It was just like I wanted to go to a football game. Mm -hmm. I wanted to go to a school dance. So what would you tell them to – how would you lie to make that happen? Um – did you say you're going to somebody's house to read the scripture? Yeah. Seriously? Honestly. Yeah. So I have this really, really specific memory of like a lie that I remember feeling like guilty for, but doing it anyway because I wanted to have this experience. 
but um, it was a friend of mine in town, and it was Halloween, and I think I was, gosh, I can't even remember the exact age. I was maybe 14 or 15, 15 probably, and I told my mom and dad that I was going to go study with my friend because she really wanted to understand why Halloween was pagan and it was bad and da-da-da. Took my Bible, took my book bag, <laughs> and I went in, and I had no, no desire to teach her anything different. I wanted to see what Halloween was about. Because that was the first time you got to experience it. Was it fifteen years old? Yeah. So that, but I also had a conscience. I mean, so that's what I'm saying. That was that's the dilemma. Like that's the dilemma. Lying outright, lying to your parents so that you can go do you know. Do something. But you just felt guilty as a person. You didn't feel like Jehovah was looking no, down on you. No, no, no. I felt gu- guilty as, like I said, morally. I was going against my moral compass. Mm-hmm. But I kind of found that the more the desire I had more to see more of what was going on outside of my bubble that I lived in, I was starting to make more of those choices to lie to be able to experience it. Yeah. Yeah, and once you start doing it and you find out you can get away with it, you try a little bit more. You try a little bit, yeah. Yeah, I did that with you. I know. Uh, I know, and I'm so glad that we can finally sit down and, you know, you can share some of it with me, but I'm like, how did I miss that? (laughs) When you want to do something and you're that age, you find a way to do it. You manipulate, yeah, you do. You find a way to do it. You do. So it's so hard for me to understand, and I'm sure anyone who listens to this what it's like to like wake up on Christmas morning and it's just another day. Like, isn't that weird? You know, it probably would be more weird if I had known what it was like. Yeah. Because I'd never known what a Christmas was like, right? I didn't know. So what you don't know, you don't miss. But the more, the older I got and the more I realized I started talking to people and they were, you know, telling me and, they come to school on, you know, after they after Christmas and they'd have all this cute stuff and oh I got a new this and yeah. And I was like, what? what is that is that sounds fun. That yeah. sounds awesome. That sounds actually really kind. You're giving people gifts. And so yeah, there was part of me that as I got older, I was just like, wow, maybe there is something to this holiday stuff. Mm-hmm. Um but I also, and you know, through my lifetime, I've developed three amazing human beings that kind of helped me through the whole trek of going through uh, t- my teenage years. And I owe a lot of like the balance that I had, um, being able to deal with what was going on at home and also feeling like I had a safety at school because I had these people that saw the other side of me, they saw the side of me that was battling this, yeah. do I stay in my home and continue to do what my parents expect of me, or do I follow my heart that tells me I don't really think I believe this religion? And they were just, yeah, they were really comforting and helping to me. Did you feel like you were two different people? Yeah, yeah. sure. Absolutely. You had to be... Jehovah Sherilyn when you were at home and then you got to be regular Sherilyn at school? Well, I wasn't ever, um, like, I think my parents knew at 15 and up that they were, it was, it was a push. They were, I wasn't faking that I was wanting to study and wanting to go to meetings. I was made to do that. Yeah. I wasn't faking it. But I think there was a bit of the fakeness going on when I was at the church because those people at church didn't know what was going on at home. They didn't know the battle at home. They just saw me sitting at the meeting with the Bible in my lap and, you know, yeah, I had to do it. So you, you reached the breaking point when you were 17 or 18? 17, my junior year. Um, there was kind of a a cracking point where I just I just couldn't do it anymore, and there were two people in the congregation who were friends of mine, and I think they knew what I was they understood what I was going through, 
They were witnesses, but they actually let me stay with them at their house. And they did give me more freedom as far as if I didn't want to go to the meeting, I didn't have to go to the meeting. Yeah. But they also gave me a place to live. That only lasted a few months. And uh, I ended up going back home just because that's a hard life to live when you're 17 and you're still yeah. going to high school. And, um, and it was actually really hard on that other couple too. There was a lot of um, backlash for them. Yeah, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. So I felt really, I, I felt guilty for that. So I went back um, home, started my senior year at home, and I just couldn't do it. And so I ended up leaving home and... Um, the people that I worked for, Charlie and Vicki Drinkwater, I worked for, that's where I worked at the Polar Bear, you know, during my, sen my senior year. Mm -hmm. They actually gave me a home and they let me live with them. And um, yeah, it was very generous and very loving. And I'll never um, forget that, that gracious, gracious gesture that they did for me. So my senior year, I did live with them. Um, Do you remember what month you moved out? Gosh, it's so much of a blur. It's really crazy how much I've blocked out. Yeah. But I want to say I lived with them for six or seven months. Yeah. Yeah, so it was probably the beginning. It was before, might have been after Christmas, because I don't remember celebrating Christmas with them. Mm. So it must have been after Christmas. It was January of my senior year. Mm. Yeah. And it it got better I mean, at least you had your freedom at that point, right? It, yes and no. I mean, it got better because I felt like I wasn't like living a lie. Yeah. Um, but it was um, emotionally devastating because um, I'm very much a family person. I mean, you know that. Like family is everything to me. And the whole idea of having to choose between wanting to be my authentic self and choosing my family was just like, I just couldn't like emotionally deal with that. Well, yeah, having to leave your your younger brother and sister too, right? Because you were kind of like her mom almost. Devastating. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and knowing, I mean, knowing how I believe, but not really knowing how they believed because I was, it was when you're 15, 17, 16, 17, you're not really thinking about the feelings of your five-year-old and your, you know, your 13-year-old brother. You're yeah. kind of like trying to survive yourself. So I didn't really get a lot of that feeling of like, oh my gosh, I've left my, my siblings in, this, in the religion. I was more just trying to survive. Yeah. The rest of that kind of came later when I got to be 22, 23, and I started thinking, oh my gosh, I left my little sister. Yeah. She was only seven years old. Mm -hmm. And we slept together. Like we slept in the same bed <laughs> until I left home. Yeah. Yeah, so, it must yeah. have sucked for her too. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, so that brings us to the the most disappointing part of the story, in that, for anybody listening, if you don't know, when when somebody leaves the church, they get excommunicated, right? Right. Is that the right term? Um, disfellowship. They call it disfellowshipped, and you know the way it worked back then in the eighties. Um, I I was. I was pressured. I mean, part of the obligation is when you become of age to make the decision that you are dedicating your life to that religion, you get baptized. And there's a real hard pressure on kids that are about 13, 14, 15, 16 to be baptized. It's kind of what your parents expect you to do. And I didn't want to. I mean, they knew it. They, they kind of put it out there. I didn't want to do it, so I didn't. And then I left home at 17. So I was never baptized. Well, the way the, the, the congregation, the way it worked was you weren't really officially disfellowshipped unless you had been baptized. Well, I wasn't baptized. Mm. So it's like they should have just probably just said, ah, lost sheep. She'll, she'll come back someday. But they didn't. They treated me like, literally like I was an adult person who had once dedicated her life to God and then said, oh, I don't want you. And that is exactly the opposite of what it was. Yeah. So 
Yeah, that was a weird thing. When you have a group of people who, and I want to say at the time, there's probably 50, 60 people in Lakeview that were witnesses. Lakeview's little. Yeah. You go into Safeway, you see those people all the time, and they would see me and turn around and walk the other way. They weren't allowed to speak to me. Yeah, so they basically erased you, right? They were shunning me because I chose to not be a part of the congregation anymore. But I was still a good human being. Mm -hmm. So that part is very sad to me that they would do that to a 17-year-old girl. Well, and correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't, didn't your parents take your pictures down and tell your brother and sister that they couldn't talk about you anymore? Correct. Um, they took my pictures down, and I literally still saw my brother in school. Mm -hmm. So it was sad. Yeah, I can't imagine. That's, that's why this story, I'm sure it's happened to a bunch of people, mm -hmm. but, I mean, you're the only one I know that it's happened to, and that's why it's so depressing that you could create these people that you are the only person that they should be able to rely upon mm -hmm. at any point in their life, and then you just delete them because they don't believe in the same fake dude sitting in the sky. Yeah, I know. I, I think that what I took from it, honestly, now that I sit here and look at you and I'm able to talk with you about it, what I took from it is, is that I knew I never wanted to be that kind of parent. Yeah. I knew that it wasn't going to – that changed me forever, knowing that no matter what you guys decided to be or love or worship or that I will, you would always be – in my life and always I always wanted you a part of my life because I knew what it felt like to have someone do the opposite. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I could speak for Callahan and Rudy and say that no matter what any of us have done, you guys have always been there. Yeah, we try. Yeah. We've done some things. <laughs> Everybody does. Everybody does. Yeah. But that's also what family's about. It's about people get to make their own choices. And then sometimes they work out and sometimes you fall. And the parents are supposed to be there to help you pick yourself up. And yeah. Yeah. So you, you finished your senior year and then, I mean, you decided you were going to go to college, right? In Klamath. Yeah. Um, so one amazing thing, I do not want to throw Lakeview under the bus at all because Lakeview had some really wonderful things that it offered um, me as a person. And one of them was the um, daily fund. So it was an opportunity for kids in the school. If you maintained a certain GPA, they literally gave you a free ride to any Oregon school. And I mean, think of what other place does that? Yeah. It, that, that is an absolute amazing, phenomenal gift that they are giving the students in Lakeview. And um, Mr. Daly, by setting that up, as, as far as I know today, it's still in, in operation. I don't know how many uh, scholarships they give out, but um, I was able to receive that gift. I mean, and think about it. I was basically... I had no income. I mean, except for working at the polar bear part-time, I had no income. I lived with a family who was gracious enough to let me live there. I didn't, they didn't pay, charge me anything. I already had had my car by the time I moved out, so I didn't need to purchase a car. So basically, I was given um, this gift to go to college. Um, oopsie, Piper, no. So I ended up going to OIT to college with my best friend, Leanne. We were roommates. Um, but let me back up a little bit because two weeks before I graduated from high school, I met this man named Chalen at Le Schwab. And we went on one date. And actually, the date happened the day after my senior party. So the funny joke about that was... 
he didn't think I was very interested in him because when he came over to pick me up, I was still sleeping because I had been up all night the night before for our senior party. And he was supposed to pick me up and take me to lunch. And I was still asleep. So he's like, oh, she must not be that into me <laughs> if she slept through our first date. So, yeah, so that backtracking a little bit, I did end up um, starting to date your dad two weeks before I went, I graduated from high school. Huh. So, and he was what, 22, he was 22 23? 23. I was 18. Um, graduated when I went off to Hawaii. That was my gift to myself for graduating. I had saved up enough money to buy an uh, airfare to Hawaii, stayed with Aunt Kathy, Uncle Greg. Um, at that time, Julia was two <laughs> and Jennifer was eight. Mm-hmm. And I went and stayed with them for two or three weeks that summer. And when I came back um, on that flight, I thought somebody else was picking me up. I thought either Leanne or Linda or Shelley was picking me up. I didn't know. And I get off the, the train um, in Klamath Falls. I don't know how that worked. I didn't just fly into Klamath Falls. But anyway, he, your dad was standing there with some flowers, picked me up from the train. <laughs> I'm like, this guy might like me. <laughs> what a romantic. This guy just might like me. So then that's when we started dating was officially when I got back from Hawaii. So in so the reason I told you that part is because you asked me about college. And for as much as I've always been absolutely adamant on the fact that studying and learning and never, you know, always recreating who you are and what, you know, what's out there. We can, you can never stop learning. Yeah. There's always every day. And that was in me. But what was in me a little bit more was I needed a family. Yeah. And I, and there was just this tug saying, you have to build. Okay. Yeah. You have to build a life and, and be able to support yourself and, and be ed- become educated so you can do that. But there was this bigger part that kept saying, but you need a family. Mm-hmm. You have to build this family. So what happened in my life prior is probably what changed the way I thought from 18, 19 on. Yeah. And so, yeah. Yeah, because you got pregnant and had me at 19, right? Well, yeah, I got pregnant. I got to go to, I went to one year at OIT and I did enjoy it. And it was, it was a wonderful experience and I'm so, so grateful. And, um, but I was also every single weekend driving back and forth to Lakeview to see your dad. And I was very much, you know, in love with him and thinking about what kind of a life we could have together. And you were a bit of a surprise, mm-hmm. um, but a, the best surprise of my life. And um, so, yeah, I found out that summer after my first year of college that you were coming along. Mm-hmm. And so your dad and I um, got married, and then we started the Maxwell clan. We started to figure out how we were going to do it. Uh, and so I wanted to ask you this, and you're not going to hurt my feelings in with any response, but was there any sense of shame when you were that young to get pregnant? Cause it's not, like you said, it was an accident. It's not what you had intended to do. And you're super young. You're in college. Yeah. Were you embarrassed? Were no, you sh- not ashamed? A, no, no, not at all. I mean, you may have thought in the eighties that that's how it was, but it really wasn't. Um, there was not one ounce of shame for me. It was more or less thinking about, I'm not going to get to finish college. Yeah. That that part of it was maybe a little bit of like, oh, I probably should have, you know, been a little more careful so I could have maybe finished the next three years of college because they were paid for. Yeah. <clears throat> so there was a little regret as far as like throwing the daily fund away because that was a beautiful thing. But the biggest, I mean, I've told you this, I've told all three of you guys this, the three very best days of my life were the days I gave birth. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, hands down, I've traveled the world. I've been, I've done some amazing, cool things. But the three most monumental, beautiful days in my life are the days I gave birth. So, I got to do it at 20 years old. Yeah. So, no, it, I have no regrets. Yeah, it's, I mean, if you don't make that decision, like I didn't make that decision either. And I had started having kids really young at 23. Uh, and 
the benefit of doing it that young is you get to be young with them. Yeah. You're not, you're not 80 years old raising a, a teenager. And so that part, that part is cool. You miss out on some of the things that you may have done, but. The 20s, your 20s are kind of a time, I mean, as I look back now, they really should be a time where you kind of figure out who you are. Yeah. And I think that you guys saved me in a way because I told you how much I had that hole in my heart of needing a family. And you guys filled that. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know who I was. Yeah. I, I wasn't even sure. I just knew I was trying to get away from one thing and then I landed in another thing. And it was, a, I mean, being a mom is the best job on the planet. And um, and I took pride in it and I loved being a mom. Yeah. So um, there's no regrets in that way. What did happen for me was each decade, I feel like I found a little bit more of myself. Mm -hmm. I figured out a little bit more who I am and who I'm meant to be. And I didn't know that when I was raising you guys in my 20s because I was just like in mom mode. Yeah. Because it's so, it's so much work, you know? You know. Yeah. Three kids and you guys were all basically, I had Chalice at 25. So I had three kids by the time I was 25. <laughs> Think about that. Yeah, it's a lot. And you guys were all like, you know, two years apart. So... I didn't really start to figure out what my purpose, besides being a mom, which is a beautiful thing, but I didn't know what my purpose was beyond that. Yeah. And so that's why I think another reason why having kids young is really kind of an awesome idea, maybe 30, not 20, but 30, um, is because by the time you guys were all grown, Dad and I had established our life. We had a little bit more money. Mm -hmm. And had I chosen to go back to school, because that was an option, honestly. I mean, when you, I, I, about 40, 41, 42, I was thinking, God, you know, I could go get a degree right now. I mean, we've got the finances to do it. I've got the time. What do you want to be? Who do you, you know, what do you want to, yeah. what do you want to teach people? What do you want to teach yourself? And that's when I had the aha moment that I was meant to see, I wanted to experience every culture. Yeah. I wanted to see how other people lived. I wanted to see how other people believed religiously. Mm -hmm. And were they kind to the people that didn't believe the way they did? Yeah. I wanted to experience that. And that was the gift I gave myself in my 40s. Mm -hmm. That's when you started traveling all over the yeah. place. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Every time you tell me you're going somewhere new, I'm like, has she been there before? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> You've been so many places. Yeah. I, the world is huge, and um, I don't think you can ever run out of places to see. Yeah. So, And even some of the places I've been, I think, gosh, I need to go back there and take somebody and show them. Yeah. You know, kind of like when you went to, to Italy first, mm -hmm. and then I said, Cody, we're going back. Yeah. I have to take that trip. <laughs> oh, gosh. That was awesome. That was an awesome. Yeah, that was fun. That was, that's probably a gift that if every mom could do at least once in her lifetime is take just one of their kids and just go experience something amazing. Mm -hmm. Because when you have more than one child, it's hard to just get some of those moments spreading it three ways, you yeah. know? But when you have one person at a time you're doing something with, it's a different experience. Yeah. You get to focus more on them. Yeah. 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 Um, so you, you were going to college. You uh, met this guy, this goober. You had a kid with him. And you start, start traveling down that path, being a mom, staying at home, taking care of these kids. And did did – the other people in your life, your your previous life, ever try to reach out and try to to make amends, or was it just kind of like this this disconnect that you mm -hmm. just was always in the back of your mind, but you couldn't quite yeah. touch? I once I was rejected by the the group of the witness people, I just kind of looked at it like they really never were my friends. Mm -hmm. They really never were my people. And so that wasn't as much of a pain to me as it was the parent, the parental part and my siblings. Mm -hmm. 
And so when I, after I had you, I was, so I was two, maybe two, three years out from being separated from my family. Um, I do remember my parents coming to see you. They were curious. Everybody wanted to meet you. I was married, so I wasn't, I guess, as much of a shame maybe to them. Hmm. I don't know how that worked. I don't know why they changed, why they changed, because I was still the same person, right? I didn't go back to the religion. But they did be, They did kind of step in a little bit more into our life. And um, I do remember them coming over and, and meeting you. And I even remember Grandma Alice holding you. I have pictures of that. Mm-hmm. She was a witness. Um, so that part of it started to change. I think they were still really thinking that they could convert us back. That I think they were trying harder with your dad. And they were trying a little bit with me as well, but, you know, it, that wasn't meant to be. And then when um, your dad decided, your dad and I decided to start moving with Les Schwab, um, that was right after Callahan was born. He was four months old. And we packed up the house in Lakeview and we filled a one little bitty U-Haul and I had a four-month-old in a car seat. And back in those days, this is how crazy this was. He was in a car seat next to me in the car because... Because <laughs> there's no airbag. There's no airbag. Plus, I didn't have anybody. I was driving our car, and Dad was driving the U-Haul with you. Mm-hmm. So we do this 12-hour trek to OMAC, start a new life. Mm-hmm. And... Um, my mom and dad were, you know, still living in Lakeview. So we were, and Graham, you know, we loved Graham and Grandpa, and off we went with the kids. And it was a growing experience for me and for your dad because we were both still really young. We had two brand new kids. And the hard part about that was your dad had a place to go to work and meet new people, and he had a purpose of, you know, what he was going to become as far as Les Schwab. And it was a lot harder for me because I was 21 years old, 22 years old with two kids, and I'm in OMAC, Washington, which is just about as little as Lakeview. Yeah. And um, so, again, it challenged me. Like, okay, how how are you going to do this? Yeah. And I've been so blessed and lucky in life to meet some really quality people that just come into my life. Yeah. And I was just gifted with two women in OMAC who um, befriended me. And we only lived in OMAC for two years. And those two ladies are, I would consider them part of my best friend collection. Yeah. Well, that's the thing about you that I don't know if it's always been a part of your personality, but you kind of make friends with everyone you meet. So I'm not but really that surprised. That level of friendship, though, Cody. I'm that's I'm. I, I thank you. That's that's such a kind, sweet thing to say. And I, and I, I hope that's true. That I can find some good in people. But there are people that touch your heart, mm-hmm. and that they see when you're hurting, or they see when you need more. They need you need you need something else besides just a hi. How are you? And when you meet those kind of people, and they're there for you, I don't know. You just they. They're with you forever. Yeah. So Cindy and Angie, shout out to them. They were great, great women and took walks with me every day. You pulled you in the wagon and it was it was adorable. Well, and something else weird happened up there, right? We lived in like four or five different houses yeah. in like a six months or like a year long span or something. Brutal. Brutal, Cody. Why why were we always moving? Because at that time with Les Schwab, they did not encourage man, uh, assistant managers to buy a house. And honestly, now that I look back at it, I don't even know if we could have afforded to buy a house anyway. I mean, we didn't have a down payment or anything. So we were renting. So we move up to OMAC, and you have like a selection of houses that we needed a four bed- or a three-bedroom house. So we needed to find a rental that was a three-bedroom house, had a decent backyard that was um, fenced for you guys. Yeah. And we found something. and But the thing was, almost every one of the places we got into was for rent with the option to buy. So the houses kept selling. I'd get in. I'd make house. I'd get the pictures up. I Back in the day, it stenciled the walls. And your mm-hmm. bedrooms were darling. And the people would sell the house. 
So we, I, I should have been a real estate agent back then because I would have sold <laughs> four houses. <laughs> yeah, you basically dolled them all up for. I went out and cleaned the yards up. They were destroyed yards when we got there. So they would have you'd be living there, and then they'd have like a showing, and people come walk through the house, and you'd have to leave. No, uh, well, two of them. Two of them, we knew that was going to happen. Yes. The last two we were in were people who owned the homes and said, oh, yeah, we'll rent them to you. This one, the last one we were in, the lady said, oh, we'll rent it to you. Her house, or her yard was destroyed. And we, I went in, pulled all the weeds, trimmed all the, the trees. I got it just so cute. And she came over one day. She even let me stencil her kitchen. She came over. She goes, oh this looks really good. I go, oh, thank you. And I just think she's giving me a compliment. And then we go, we take a family vacation down to see grandma and grandpa in Lakeview. And we get a phone call from her and she says, I'm going to give you guys 30 days. I want the house back. We lived in that house two months. What? Yeah. That's brutal. So, but the weird thing is, is that those four moves one, two, three, four. Those four moves all happened in the same division, the same housing division. So I remember a couple of the moves actually putting like some of our stuff in the wagon, the little red wagon, and pulling it to and from the houses while dad was at work wow. because it was so close. Because they were all brand new houses? No, they were just, it was a subdivision kind of like this. But that's so weird that they were all in the same area. I know. It was very weird. And we had a reputation for like, oh, well, get her in that house. She'll clean the yard up. (laughs) Yeah, right. No, it was just everything about that transition in OMAC was um, just hard. Mm -hmm. It was hard. Yeah. But he got hired in Hermiston. And um, when we moved to Hermiston, same idea. Mm -hmm. Um, Please don't buy. Just rent. You're only going to be there two years. And so we did rent a house. You rem- I don't know if you remember it from pictures, maybe. It. You were bit. five. Um, but we got to stay in that house for the full two years. Mm-hmm. And that was like, that was a gift. Oh, my gosh, I get to live in the same house for two years in a row? So when we finally moved to the Dells, you were five. You were just going into kindergarten. Mm-hmm. Callahan was three and a half. Shellis was 18 months old. I said to your dad, don't make me move again. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, I've moved and I, I've, I wanted the same things you did as far as being in management with Les Schwab, but don't make me move again. I want our kids to stay in the same school system. I want to buy a house. Well, he was a manager at that point, so he didn't have to, right? Well, yeah. I mean, he could have still moved up with Les Schwab. That's how it works. But I didn't, I was like, hey, let's be happy with what we have. Yeah. Well, and then... As time went on, you continued down a creative path and then started your own business. Yeah. Yeah. I know. That was kind of a nightmare for you guys. I don't think so. I mean. Slave slave wages? (laughs) It was worse for dad than me. (laughs) No, he was at work. You guys didn't have, he didn't have as much. Irishella still says, you made me stain crafts, mom. (laughs) Like she says, I'm damaged. No, it was fun. Um, I even actually, Cody, I did dabble in crafting when I was in OMAC, but it was mainly just to decorate our house. Mm -hmm. So I always kind of knew I needed to have that creative outlet. It's kind of part of my personality. Um, But to actually make it a business, that came into play in the early 90s because of crafters malls. They started sprouting up all over Oregon. They were actually all over the place. But like in a mall or are you talking about like traveling? So they call them crafters malls. So meaning like in a mall area or like down in Bend, they had an entire um, marketplace where you could rent a booth. Yeah. If you yeah. were a crafter. And in the, in the Dells. Kind of like a trade show. In the Dells, they had a crafters market or not a crafters market. It was called Creative Cottage. And, um, oh no, 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 not before Creative Cottage. It was the crafters mall. And I rented a booth for $30 a month or something. I rented this booth out. And then whatever crafts I put in there, I had to give them 20%. Mm -hmm. But it started to give me an idea of what it was like to be an entrepreneur. So you just decided to do it? No one was like, hey, maybe you should sell these. 
Well, yeah. I mean, I'd always been giving, giving gifts and that kind of thing with my crafts. And then, yes, it did come into play. Well, gosh, you know, you should sell these. Make six of them instead of two of them, mm-hmm. right? And so that's how that kind of got started. And that was in the early 90s. I started the business Heartwarming Dreams. Mm-hmm. And that lasted. I had that, actually, that tax ID for 22 years. What would you get rid of it for? Um, I just decided to rename myself and um just I had kind of changed my style a little bit and I don't know just recreate so when you started doing it at the shop in downtown the Dalles did people start paying you rent to put their stuff in or was it mainly just your stuff at that point so I was at the crafters mall for a few years and then I met a lady who owned who who started the business creative cottage it was a young girl and she had been purchasing crafts from me for quite a while in the crafters mall. And I didn't know her, but she knew me because my name was stamped on the back of my stuff. And she said, would you be interested in um, putting your stuff in my shop? And all I need, I'm not going to ask you to rent the space. I'm just going to ask if for like a 25% commission. And I was like, sure. And she goes, well, honestly, I'd knock it down to 20% commission if you'd work a day or two a month. I was like, absolutely. So that's how Creative Cottage began for me. And I only did that literally for uh, a year, a year and a half. Um, And then we had some things happen in our family Mm -hmm. that kind of changed that perspective for me as far as much much time as I was taking in Mm -hmm. the shop and just kind of reevaluated how much time I was spending with my business. And so I kind of restructured myself at that time and didn't kind of pulled away from Creative Cottage. Mm -hmm. And then after that, Creative Cottage cottage was sold to another woman. Well, it's impossible to keep a business running in downtown the Dallas anyway. You know, um, Sean Sean McClary, who had purchased it from that original girl, and and Sean bought my part out as well, um, she kept that store. She kind of re-evolved or um, re-did that store and lasted, I want to say, 15 years. Really? Yeah, she added a, a food area, and she made, a, it was a it was a little area where you could get coffee and lunches and then go walk next door and do crafts. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, she did hold it together. But, you know, having a small business and running it out of a shop takes an enormous amount of time. Yeah, you're, I mean, if you break it down, you're making like $5 an hour. Yeah. You know, at yeah. a certain point, depending on how much time you put into yeah, it. Yeah, it definitely wasn't as lucrative as I feel like crafting is to me now. Yeah. But back then it was more about just, I think, I don't know if the prestige is the right name, but I think there's something about being a shop owner or saying that's my store. Yeah, for sure. But for me and my kind of financial brain, it has, it needs to scribble out on paper too. You need to be able to say you're making some money. Yeah, well... Most people who take on something like that, they're either the creative force who makes the stuff or they're like the numbers person in the background that's taking care of of the books. Like there aren't many people that do all of it because it's just too much. Yeah. And if you're more like creatively driven, you don't care about the financial stuff. Yeah. Well, I think that's maybe where I came to when I dabbled back into the business again, where I was um, doing it more so in shows. Mm-hmm. And so you, that's interesting that you brought that point up because I think that I do have both those brains. Yeah. Yeah. And I think what happened was I realized I love to craft, but I want to be paid what I'm worth to do it. Yeah. And so when I started doing shows, that that kind of brought those two things together. So you take a massive amount of merchandise into a show and I pay them a commission, but I also raise my price if I'm at a show. So I'm really getting what I wanted. Yeah. And well, I'm paying them their commission. Well, yeah. And that's the thing. You can charge whatever you want when you're out there. Yeah. So that's that was the perfect world of doing that. And I wasn't obligated to be at a shop every day where I was taking away time from my family and my kids. And, you know, I wanted to be, you know, how fast your kids grow. Yeah. It, you blink and your kids are in high school. So that was also in the back of my mind thinking, you know, I have the rest of my life to be an entrepreneur. Yeah. But I only have like this window 
of time where my kids are going to actually be at home and want to be around me. I mean, when you hit 15, 16, you didn't want to be around me, but I still made you be home for dinner. <laughs> Bring your friends over, but make sure you're home for dinner because yeah. I still want to be able to see you. But yeah. yeah, it's just a short amount of time, so mm-hmm. you don't want to waste it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, we can we can kind of wrap it up with the final thing then. Um, just about like bringing it around with all the stuff that you went through as a kid and dealing with your parents and then you became a parent young and then you had to deal with me and Callahan and Rudy. Do you think it was harder? Do you think, do you think you were more prepared because of certain things that happened in your life? Mm. Or was it just you had no idea why anything was happening? Mm. Like why your kids were revolting in the way that they did? You guys revolting? Yeah. Um, so that's, that's interesting because I was thinking a bunch of things while you were talking. I think, <laughs> I think that... What happened in my life, my early experiences in my life, I think they made me make choices, adult choices, earlier than I was ready to Mm -hmm. make adult choices. But because of that, I also think I matured really fast. And that being said, I was ready to be a mom. I mean, yeah, 20s young, but you guys were exactly what I needed to nurture and love and put that that brokenness that I was feeling by not having a family. I was able to nurture that brokenness with you guys. Yeah. What you were saying about the rebelliousness about you guys when you got to be 15, 16, I think my personality I probably taught you some of that. I probably taught you. If you don't believe what I said, you better probably say, well, why are you telling me that? Mm -hmm. I probably taught you a lot of that. You did. And I don't know if I've ever told you that, but I'm sure I've gotten a lot of that from you. I know. Because you you just kind of say, screw you. I'm going to do what I want. Or just, you can't tell me how to think. I, I have a brain. I'll think myself. Sometimes when I'm the most frustrated with shallous, it's probably when I see myself coming out of her. Yeah. And I'm like, ah! Is that what I look like? Ah! <laughs> but, but in a way, I mean, I can't be angry about it. All I can do is be grateful that we still all love each other and we still all care about each other and we still all support each other. Like, that's the biggest gift in the world, to know that we can go through some of those turmoils, all of those turmoils that we've gone through with your teenage years. You grew out of that, then you became a young dad, and you've had different things. Same with, you know, Callahan and Chellis. We all have things that happen in life, but the true test is if you love each other through it. Yeah. Like, you just don't give up. Yeah. And... Like I said, there's nothing any of you guys could ever do that would make me not be there for you when you were ready to talk to me. Mm -hmm. And that I learned from my experiences before. I was like, I know how much I need that. So I know that's what my kids need. Yeah. Well, and even to go as far as to forgive your parents and to, even though I refused to do it from all the things that I knew, uh, you went back and tried to, to yeah. fix what you could before he passed away. Yeah. Which is really cool. Thanks. I did that. Um, of course, not everybody understands it or agrees with it. Um, but I did that for myself. Yeah. And um, I've explained it to my brother and my sister, and they have their own path. Um, and I don't need to be friends with, you know, all – the people from my past that were in the religion. I don't, I don't need that because they didn't help get me to where I am today. Um, but what I do need, I did need the love of my parents. I, I did need that. And the final way that I was able to achieve that with both my mom and my dad was just breaking it down to the most simple dynamic that I don't need them to convert me. I don't need them to teach me their way. I know their way. 
I, I understand their way, and I'm, I'm glad for them that they have that. But I need their love as parent. Yeah. And as long as we could keep it simple, like, Dad, let's talk about sports. Let's talk about our kids. Let's talk about going to Mexico together. Don't try to convert me. I am your daughter. I'm not somebody that you're going to meet going door to door. I'm your daughter. Just yeah. love me as your daughter. And once once he actually grasped that, Cody, it was easy. Yeah. Yeah, too bad it took so many years. No. But I did get to say goodbye, and that was I'm grateful for that. And uh, life is hard, you know? I mean, it's not all easy, so... You just have to work through each of those things as they come and uh, saying goodbye to somebody that you didn't really get to spend as much time with as you wanted to. Yeah. That's hard. Yeah. But being able to forgive people is a good thing. Yeah. It's yeah. hard, but. It's hard. Yeah. It's hard. Okay. Well, I think that's a good spot to end it. Love you, honey. I love you too. Thanks for doing it with me. Yeah.